Our first panel today is dealing with artificial intelligence and journalism. How do these two go together, you ask? Well, the answer is deepfake. What stands behind the deepfakes? Are they a real danger to our society? And how is it possible to detect a deepfake? We are looking for answers, and therefore, we welcome Wilfried Runde, Head of Research and Cooperation Projects at the Deutsche Welle. Welcome. Yes, hello, good morning. Thanks for, for having me. Thanks for inviting me over to, to Midweida, actually from Bonn. That's where I live and, uh, and work. But before um, I actually start with a presentation or say kind of, maybe it's always a kind of a lecture that I'm, that I'm going to do. Let's see. Um, I show you a few ducks. Let's see. <laughs> Sie Larve. Sie Larve, wenn grün ist. Oh, Lex, das ist geil. All right. Um, does anybody know this video? Show of hands. Ah, okay, very few. Uh, still, I mean, the, the claim here is, uh, do German ducks actually wait at the traffic light for green to cross? Coming back to that at the very end, and I then we'll give that away. Before we start, as that a bit of context, huh? I'm with Deutsche Welle, and at least in Germany, that's kind of frequently confused with other German public service media like Deutschland Radio, Deutschland Funk. It's not us. It's Deutsche Welle, made for Mainz. This is our claim, so I guess I also came to the to the right place. Um, and we are actually. Germany's international public media house. So we actually really have programs in 30 languages, that is 3030 languages, working for Deutsche Welle, like I do in, uh, in Bonn, is working on a daily basis with uh, 60 nations under one roof. So it's no surprise that, that we are labeled kind of the, the small UN of the media houses, at least uh, in Germany. So what do I do at, uh, at Deutsche Welle? Again, just to give you some context, I'm the head of research and cooperation projects that where we look at the interface of technology, um, AI, uh, for example, and, uh, and journalism. So, um, and there are many, many textbooks on innovation management, but actually this is the only quote I believe in when it comes to getting innovation on the ground. Huh? You need angry people, you need people that are dissatisfied with the status quo, that want to push the envelope, that want to achieve something, that want to go exactly beyond this status quo. That's um, hence this, uh, this quote from, uh, from Tom Peters. But actually, it's not like that. I mean, like myself, my team is also kind and also very diverse. We have many journalists, we have developers, of course, we have uh, a lawyer, huh, the, uh, which you need to have. We have a designer, a data journalist. So there is a full range to cover the, the kind of topics that we, that we address and that I will, will show you later. So as this uh, talk and the, and the panel um, has a headline, AI uh, in journalism, but I was actually supposed to focus on deepfake. I, I think it, it would still make it worthwhile to, to just pan out a little and look at uh, AI and yeah, the current perception of AI, because AI is, of course, a lot more uh, than deepfakes. And as is what the headline, I thought, okay, boom, I give you two presentations for the price of one. And I talk a bit about, uh, about artificial uh, intelligence. And so this is, uh, strangely enough, uh, the perception of artificial intelligence uh, as it is in the media when you talk artificial intelligence um, and journalism. It's a whole lot of mechanic or robot hands uh, on keyboards. And uh, those are all very, very uh, respected quality media. This is The Guardian, this is The New York Times, this is The Atlantic. Uh, but they all seem to have the same metaphor when it comes to AI and journalism. It's robot journalism. Oh God, robots are taking our jobs. 
And if I can say one thing for sure after like a few years looking into that topic is that this is definitely not the future of AI in journalism. There will be no robot colleague sitting on your desk, uh, whatever, tomorrow or next year or in five years and, and will do your job. Yeah? AI is like everywhere and it's also in, uh, in, in deep fakes and countering them. But um, we've seen modules that can do um, very, very simple text. And that's the state of AI in journalism as it stands. Yeah? There's a lot happening in the background, but it's not a matter of good or bad robot. Yeah? There is a lot to look at. There is also a thing like AI ethics. So look into who produces that particular piece of software, that particular piece of artificial intelligence, and then you can um, yeah, hold them to account, as you should, as journalists. Um, although, Hello everyone, in this is my very first day in Xinhua News Agency. My voice and appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor with Xinhua. The development of the media industry calls for continuous innovation and deep integration with the international advanced technologies. I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as texts will be typed into my system uninterrupted. The last sentence was, of course, the most important one. Uh, someone is typing input so that these computer generated images, if you wish, also a kind of deep fake, uh, can really sit and read out the news to audiences. But this is a mechanical task. These are nothing more than digital puppets that repeat a text that is fed to them by human editors. Of course, they will never take a leave. They are never sick. Uh, they can work more than 24 for, for hours continuously. And um, yeah, you will probably never have a quarrel with them. They would probably pretty much do what, what you want to do. And they are kind of real. They were introduced uh, early summer uh, this year by Jingyua, a news agency. But um, as far as we see now, there is not a major uptake. This is uh, a showcase for technology in, uh, in journalism and what it can do. But it by, it's by no means something that will replace someone here striving to get um, to be a moderator in any time to come. So, uh, just for you as a takeaway, don't believe the hype. Yeah? Look at what's really happening. Uh, but of course, do acquire knowledge about artificial intelligence, as said, especially um, who is programming this uh, artificial intelligence. So hold these people to account. Uh, this is what good journalism does. And find stories. There are a tremendous truckload of stories out there on AI, where AI actually takes decisions, political decisions, social decisions. For example, when it comes to social rankings, which are in place in several countries in the, in the, EU, in the EU, especially in Scandinavia. Based on an AI decision, you would get a point rate, and they would decide about your social benefits, for example. So just these are the kind of stories that you should look for, and you should by no means be worried about your jobs in the near future to come. So this is what I want to give away on, on AI. Now, part two. This is actually the focus part, and... Um, Again, China for whatever reason, but this is kind of a translation mistake, but a very funny one. It's an actual, uh, actual poster uh, in a, um, a north, of, uh, north of Beijing, and it says, be careful of, of the truth, where it should say, be careful of the falling rocks or something like that. So, be careful of the truth, and this is basically what I will try to um, encourage you to do, actually, with, with that uh, presentation. And um, as every good presentation, um, I have a summary up front. So if you want to leave now, or if you, this is kind of the blinkest version of, uh, of my presentation. So this is the takeaway. Uh, I want to show you three things. Technology disrupts democracy. Very simple and blunt. Lies kill people. 
And third, seeing is no longer believing. Remember the ducks, huh? Just as a hint. Good. And then I have <laughs> three parts, um, and they are, for those uh, not familiar with, with American nursery rhymes, this is a rhyme, liar, liar, pants on fire. I, I don't have a, a proper translation for that in, uh, in, 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 in German, especially the pants on fire uh, part here. But my main um, claim here is we have two types of liars outside in the media sphere that, that do influence us. Um, and together, they have inflamed the pants of everyone in this room, the pants of various countries, if you allow me this strange metaphor. But uh, I will explain. Okay, so let's start with liar number one. I would love to do a presentation without him um, or whatever, but I'm carrying him, him around for, for three years uh, or more because, as you will see, it all kind of started uh, with him. But in that case, it's not just him. The first part, the first whatever breed of liars is more... Uh, yeah, a breed that was, that was around for, for many centuries. Yeah? It's people that deliberately won't tell you the truth or distort it. You're talking misinformation, you're talking propaganda, and he's by no means the first one uh, to do this. Still, he started pretty early uh, using the channels that he now masters so well. This is from 2012 and is uh, as untrue as it was in 2012. So um, this is just to show the evolution. But as said... Um, he's by no means alone on this planet. People winning elections with lies. This is uh, the uh, elected president uh, in Brazil, Javier Bolsonaro. Um, he has even uh, been convicted by, uh, by a court, by judges, in six times for lying during his campaign. Convicted liar. Still, people trusted his campaigns, mainly fired via WhatsApp, because that is kind of a secluded environment. That is an environment where you trust your friend. Oh, your a friend sent me this. That must be true. And he sent hilarious stuff. He sent uh, photos of people that um, perceivedly had been beaten up by the opponent who were totally not true. Famous people uh, among them. And uh, still, he wasn't challenged. He's now the president-elect in Brazil. And you have numerous other examples. Here's another one that I carry for whatever, three, four years now. This is probably the biggest and bluntest lie that was even uh, transported that drove through the country. So it's a, it's a lying bus that drove through the country. Uh, and it says, this is what we give to the EU every week. Let's spend it different. Okay. This figure is only true if you're really very bad on math. Yeah? You have to look. It's much more complex. People don't take that uh, approach. Yeah? This is actually where you reduce stuff and the actual figure is a lot lower. It's one-third lower, actually. But everybody saw the bus, everybody saw the 350 million. That's a deliberate lie, but for a, a, a specific purpose. That's what we call misinformation and propaganda. So, um, as said, it all kind of started three years uh, ago, and we coined new terms. We had to find new terms for, for what we've seen. And I want you, maybe you can, can have this uh, uh, sufficiently loud, uh, to listen what Newt Gingrich said. Newt Gingrich ran for president uh, in, the, in the 2000s. He's a very um, front row person for the Republican Party. And this is an interview that he gave during the 2016 election campaign, and it's the most revealing piece of video that I know on this topic. Violent crime is down. The economy it's is not down ticking in the, up. It is not down in the biggest cities. Violent crime murder rate is down. But it how come, is then down. how come it's up in Chicago, up in Baltimore, and there up in Washington? There are pockets where cer certainly we your have not tackled Your national murder capital, your third, your, your third biggest city. But violent crime across the country is down. The average American, I will bet you this morning, does not think crime is down, does not think they are safer. But it is. We are safer, and it is down. No, that's your view. Yeah, I just told no. I, 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 national I, FBI but what I said, but what I said is also no. What I said is also a fact. 
current view is that liberals have a whole set of statistics which theoretically may be right, but it's not where human beings are. But what you're saying yeah, is, but, but, uh, hold, but hold on, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, because you're saying liberals use these numbers, they use this sort of sure. magic math. This is uh, the FBI statistics. They're not a liberal organization. No, They're but what I said is equally true. People feel, feel more threatened. Yes, they feel it, but the facts don't support Fine. it. As a, as a political ca candidate, I'll go with how people feel, and I'll let you go with the theoreticians. Okay, it's uh, as open as he can be. I mean, it's very transparent. He just even admits, so he is uh, with the feelings rather than the facts. And back in 2016, kind of a thing that we forgot a bit, we, we coined a new phrase, we call it the, the post-fact times, and... Uh, even uh, Chancellor Merkel uh, cited that and, 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 and also acknowledged that, that this is the fact. But what, what do you do about it? Is that, is that really uh, you, you look at the feelings instead of the, instead of the facts? I think this is where this specific uh, kind of, uh, of liar is, is kind of trapped in nowadays. Because when you trust feelings, you only have uh, a major choice of four feelings that are hardwired in your brain. Huh? And that is, of course, sadness, it's joy or surprise, but unfortunately, anger is the most important feeling because from anger, you learned. Yeah? Our ancestors learned from angry experience. Oh, there's this animal trying to kill me. Wow, uh, I better beware next time. So this is what stuck, stuck with you. And what algorithms do on social networks is they try to foster interaction. They want you to view at the angry stuff, get angry yourself and share that. Or be joyful, be sad. But this is where social media amplifies the kind of lies that these people deliberately spread into that sphere. And we have a good uh, example here because, again, the US uh, election is very well um, researched. You have 230 million U.S. people, but uh, in the study at question or in the operation in question, the data of 30 million people, so only a fraction of these 230 million people, was enough to um, group these people. Well, you think you have a big diversity still. We have common denominators. Um, and we have a method that we now call behavioral micro-targeting. So this is you can address very small communities if you have the precise data. And this is also something journalists need to be aware about. What are the inner workings of social networks in relation to political campaigns, for example? Because what happened here is, uh, is that Cambridge Analytica, I guess everyone in this room ha has heard that, were hired by the Trump campaign to do exactly that, behavioral micro-targeting. How did they do it? They had um, um, a series of tests uh, that they called the ocean tests, so where specific mindsets of yours would be tested. And this is how this looks. So you get... Maybe you know those from your, your Facebook or, or Instagram tweet, uh, feeds. Uh, you are asked, okay, to rate yourself, to judge yourself, to give away something about you. And so that was put into, uh, into, into various profiles. And if the profiles matched, then the respective campaign could send posts like this to the people they had uh, identified. Those, back in the days, 2016, were so-called dark posts. So you couldn't even see them if you're not the owner of that stream. That is something Facebook has allegedly disallowed now, but still you can, you can um, book campaigns for target groups that you have identified. There's nothing changed here. The dark post as such is probably gone, but that is the mechanics behind that. You can target very small communities, decisive communities, because remember, 230 million people, and this is the margin Trump won by. This is the margin. Those are not even 100,000 people that decided uh, the election in three key states, and so he got enough votes to become a president. And Cambridge Analytica, the behavioral micro-targeting uh, micro was instrumental to these 
small wins in the countries that mattered. So this is, uh, a new, these are new instruments, these are new tools that these deliberate liar have, and we as journalists need to know that and we need to hold them to account. Good. Liar part two. Um, and those, I guess, I mean, like, who's not on a social network here in this room? Someone really... Everyone. Ah. So, this is just for comparison reasons. So, you see the... You especially uh, may find the, uh, the user uh, base for, uh, for Twitter kind of um, not so relevant if you look at the, at the user figures of the other uh, social networks because... There's a lot of buzz there on, uh, on, on Twitter. But as I said, this is the echo chamber. This is the amplifier for all kinds of, uh, of lies. And again, allow me one last view at the uh, 2016 elections. What also infiltrated that sphere was what we by then called fake news. I will uh, give away later why we don't like this term uh, anymore. But this is hilarious stuff that was just out there, mainly on Facebook and at their own pages. But uh, funny enough, loads of these really, really strange new stuff um, was produced here. This is the um, train station in Veles in Macedonia. In Veles in Macedonia, the average income is between 400 and 800 euro. The people that produced this news and got ad dollars, advertising dollars from Facebook and Google because that stuff was clicked, was shared, there was a lot of interactions, they earned about 3,000 euro a month. So that's already a huge economical reason why you want to be in that game of, uh, of producing fake news. And uh, as said, this is all very well researched. Does this have an impact? Does it have uh, a reach? And absolutely, this is the case, uh, especially in the, in the end, in the last three months before the elections, these um, kind of fake news sites got a lot more traffic, a lot more interaction than the incumbents like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and, and you name it. This is where uh, this scissor uh, was built. And so you see that there, that there has been uh, an impact within this echo chamber. So Facebook um, took that uh, as, a, as, an as, as a reason to group those um, different kind of actors on these uh, on this, uh, on this platforms to see uh, can we categorize it. And they came along with bad actors, bad behavior, and bad content. And sometimes it's, of course, the three combined. And what follows now uh, is a random, a random kind of tour de force uh, through stuff that has been manipulated. Uh, as uh, I expressed in the beginning, we have Deutsche Welle, 30 languages, <laughs> so the, the world is, is kind of our, uh, our target group, and so you can multiply the, um, the problems that you have with misinformation, probably by 30 maybe even a, a bit more in these different regions. So um, showing more examples of misinformation and propaganda is uh, another <laughs> presentation of one and a half hours. So the, the, uh, the, the selection that I have now is kind, kind of random, but I hope to show the full range from, okay, that was like three, four years ago, to this is now, this happened three weeks ago or two weeks ago even. So... Um, Bad actors, let's start with that. That is Eduardo Martins, um, or is he? He portrayed himself on Instagram as a successful uh, photographer, as a war photographer even. There was uh, a, a screenshot of his account in the early days uh, when he was at his peak. He had almost half a million uh, followers and that's the sad part, news agencies were buying his photos that he stole from other accounts. So, um, and there were also quality media uh, amongst them that used that. And it was the BBC that revealed that he was uh, a fake because he had managed to funnel one picture into the, into the BBC and they followed that up and found, okay, that person does not exist. So, uh, this, as I said, distorts the whole 
sphere for, for news, but yeah, also for, for society. This, another example, two years ago, it's not to challenge your eyesight here, uh, it's only the colors that matter. Those are the most interacted with articles about Angela Merkel from 2017. And as you can see with the, um, with the multi-red here, out of uh, 10 of these top 10 articles, 70% 70, uh, 70 are outright false, two are an opinion piece, and only one contained the facts. So that's just a snapshot. Of course, things may have improved since then, but that's the mere reality of Warspear. Some stuff is outright silly, of course. You don't believe that or you don't want to believe that. But still, this source, Use Village, is, uh, is, is um, up and kicking. So they, they have stuff like that, which is... They're, they're portraying themselves on the, on the interface between satire and, and journalism or whatever you, you may call that. But it's very easy to mistake that. And it's mostly clickbait to get some attention uh, dollars and, and attention advertising. These kinds of photos, it's, it's any given hurricane in the US uh, in the past 10 years, I had to say, uh, because this is, should be the Dallas airport in 2018 after the hurricane. Uh, it's of course not true. It's a, it's a Photoshop piece, which is all too easily done. But this is the stuff that goes viral. More, um, say, saddening uh, are the footage that we get uh, from war zones, countries with very low media literacy. Um, and you see, if you look at the, at the retweets, that this uh, is a tweet that reaches millions of people. Yeah? A five uh, to six figure retweet rate is immensely high. A million of people see this, and neither the picture on the left nor on the right is taken in Syria. It's the first uh, Iran, Iran war, and the other one is from Palestine. So not any connection to this, but still this is widely shared. This is the stuff that you see, you get sad, and you want other to be sad as well, or angry, because that happens uh, in, uh, in, in and around Syria, which is does, but not on this photo. More recent example, uh, this is the president-elect uh, of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari, and just to give you an, an, an idea of the magnitude of, uh, of this, there was a really very badly photoshopped image of him um, where he is portrayed as someone being left-handed instead of, uh, of right-handed and vice versa. So he had to give a press conference and say, okay, sorry, I was not replaced by a double. I'm the real person, see, I'm signing stuff with my uh, right hand and I'm, um, I'm real, uh, I've not been replaced. And that was like three months before the election. So in a crucial time, uh, this is when, what, what, what comes. There's a recent example. We have many more of them. This is again from, um, from this spring and uh, it's yet another war zone because as we said in, in war, the truth is the first, is the first victim. This is the uh, post that a group called Indian Army Group published on, uh, on, on Facebook, like end of, uh, end of February, and it allegedly portrayed the so-called Pulvana incident at the border India to Kashmir. And what happened here is actually what happened in the, uh, in, in the next video, because this is the original video. It's five years old, it's from the Turkey-Syrian uh, border, and it shows a real explosion but there is no connection to India, to Kashmir, to the explosion that actually happened. And if you look at I mean, this is an example, if you want to do a, a lecture on this, if you want to do a textbook example of misinformation, please go and check the Pulvana incident, because this one started a deluge of, uh, of, of false information, blaming everyone involved, politicians being portrayed with the assassin, uh, like really a textbook example, if you uh, like, go, go, go there. Um, and um, the next one, oh, there's one missing. Sorry. <coughs> I had one more example, and there was a recent one. Uh, it was from Germany. It was the only uh, German um, slide that, that I have. Maybe it said auto-deleted for that, for that reason. And that was an incident three weeks ago in Munich where uh, old videos were used of street riots in Florence in Italy to say, okay, here they are again. Here are refugees uh, kind of 
vandalizing uh, in, the midst of, in the midst of Munich. It was totally not true. And the police in Munich had to issue a statement out on social media and said, don't believe this. It's not true. These pictures are not taken in Munich. They are taken in, in Italy, in Florence, and they're two or three years old. So sorry that this is missing from here, but that was the most recent example. Maybe we recuperate the slide. OK, this is what you get when you do a uh, Google image search for pens on fire. You actually get pens on fire because you get everything in, uh, on Google. And now, and the third part, and whatever, is that the saddest part? I don't know. But we had these two big groups of liars, the amplifier and the originator. Very bad interaction between the two. What is the impact? Does it have an impact, or can we just say, okay, let, let's, let's just, it will, it will go away. Sorry, it won't. And of course, the first victim, as uh, the previous slides already showed, is kind of also journalism. It is. And so here is uh, my metaphor for that. Boom. <laughs> Again, not, no colleague was hurt in filming this. This is from a, from a movie, actually. But again, th that pops up every time there is a kind of a bad weather situation and a hurricane and, and stuff. Not true. If you come across that, it's, a, it's false. Um, no, it's much, it's much deeper than that because even the Pope, we come back to the Pope as well, uh, says so the, the serpent's temptation was the first uh, kind of misinformation and we have to live with that. But there is him again. So he is kind of the master. And here's also how he turned around this false information bit, this fake news word that we don't use anymore. We go for misinformation and propaganda, actually, uh, against the media in tweets like this, which, again, were widely popular, widely shared. Um, this, is, this is what, what, yeah, what, what, dare I say, dictators do. Uh, they're trying to, um, yeah, to, to foster distrust in, in media, and they say, okay, they're not actually me, me, they're, they're your enemies. They're the enemies of the people. Yeah? So, uh, and this is what also led to this harsh divide that we now see in, uh, in America. you either a uh, Republican or a Democrat, but there's little, little gray in between, and tweets like this eroded the trust in the media. Um, but he's not alone. Huh? This is a huge uh, survey from, uh, from Reuters with uh, yeah, actually 74,000 participants uh, all over the world. And the question was, have you heard someone, uh, a politician, head of state, saying, um, okay, using the word fake news the way Trump used the word fake news? And not surprisingly, uh, it's 49% overall had heard that. And in the top figures is the US, uh, but then also not surprisingly, Hungary and Turkey following immediately behind. But as I said, it's all over the world. Give uh, Mr. Duterte 20 seconds. But since you are uh, a fake uh, news uh, outlet, then uh, I am not surprised that your articles are also fake. Now, we can debate now. Tell me where is our lies, and I'll tell you where are yours. Just an example. You stand at press conference anywhere in, in Manila, and he's using the fake news word against the media. So this is common now. OK, uh, another word for this is, of course, uh, liar's press. We hear it uh, a lot. Um, but, but this is when it already is going through that phase and, and uh, the perception is, okay, the media are telling more lies uh, than truth. This is when, when these people have won their information war. And it even gets worse. Here's another kind of revealing excerpt from the campaign. That's terrible. And then they said, you know, he's killed reporters. And I don't like that. I'm totally against that. I, by the way, I hate some of these people, but I'd never kill them. <laughs> I hate them. No, I think, no, these people... Honestly, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. I would never kill them. I would never do that. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I wouldn't. I would never kill them. But I do hate them. And I, I, some of them are such lying, disgusting people. It's true. It's true.
This is a sad reality uh, in, in many countries. And again, some, some examples, very quick, where this uh, headline from the, from the New York Times is a sad uh, reality. Uh, Facebook is kind of, or take any, uh, it's not only Facebook, but as they are the biggest player, together with Instagram, same company, never forget. Also WhatsApp, same company, never forget. Um, uh, they are the, uh, the major player here. And for example, Sri Lanka in, in 2018, uh, there were a, a week of riot, uh, and the first measure of the government was to close down uh, all the social networks because the riots had been fueled by social networks and by incredible stories, stuff that you just won't believe if they hadn't been very well reported. The original story and where it started with was that a Muslim chef in, uh, near to the, to the second biggest city in his restaurant was putting birth control pills, contraceptives into his food for non-Muslim guests, so Buddhist mainly. Hard to believe, of course, not true, but it was widely shared. Uh, it got into WhatsApp group and there was an immediate call for arms. Okay, let's go down there and kill that guy which they did, yeah? They killed him, they devastated his, uh, his house, and, uh, and, and, and um, yeah, there were more victims in the, um, in the following days until the government acted, and uh, there was a state of emergency for one week. India, uh, it's a vast country, but with very little media literacy, especially in rural uh, areas. And here's another true story from late 2000. Uh, and 18, because this video went viral, but it was edited. The people that saw it on their smartphones didn't see the first 10 seconds and the last 10 seconds, but these are the crucial parts. Okay, so take out the first 10 seconds and the last 10 seconds. You see people on a motorcycle possibly kidnapping a child from the street, then driving out of town. You don't see the return, you don't see the poster that's part of a campaign to prevent just that. Yeah? And this is what happened in rural areas. About 30 motorcyclists uh, were killed because people thought, okay, I know them from that video, they are... The, um, the kidnappers, yeah? without any trial, without police, without acquisition, just because they were angry, apparently. Huh? So, true story, um, that was the time when we reported it, uh, there was like 30 victims, the, the total number was almost 40, then in the end, before, that was kind of debunked, everybody knew it. Okay, just to add up here, Myanmar is another sad case, because in Myanmar, and in many of these countries, uh, Facebook is the internet. People don't see anything other than Facebook because they come bundled with their telephone subscription. There's no need for data subscription because Facebook is part of the deal already. Again, false news on both sides. Um, I could add to that. And um, yeah, this is what you think is far away, but it's rather not. Ah, okay, I think here are the German examples. This is a study. Um, from three universities in, in the US that the New York Times picked up last year that there is a correlation between attacks uh, on refugees and how well-connected people are on Facebook in certain groups. Um, and this is the one <laughs> that I was referring to earlier, the only German uh, thing that I have. This is the Munich incident. You look at the, uh, at the timestamp, it's 3rd November 2019. 
and it's the police going against that. So you had a certain virality here already before the police is going into that because they don't want to put an attention to stuff like that. But when it is over a certain threshold, boom, there it's, uh, the police has to act according to that. Good, and this all happened on, say, Facebook platforms. That was a WhatsApp thing. But Facebook is not a media company, at least they, they don't think they are. So what actually is Facebook? Maybe Mr. Zuckerberg can give us a hint. Spectre showed me how to manipulate you into sharing intimate data about yourself and all those you love for free. The more you express yourself, the more we own you. Okay. The more you express yourself, the more we own you. Did he say that? Ah. Maybe not, huh? Maybe this is the first real deep fake that I show. He never said that. But it looks kind of realistic, doesn't it? And especially because you think, okay, that could be true. Yeah, you, he could have said that, but maybe not on video and not on, uh, on camera. So, um, but this is a deep fake. Yeah, this is where someone took Mark Zuckerberg's video and... and yeah, put another audio on it and, and manipulated the audio. And here we are in Digger Deepfake Detection. Digger is actually a project that we just started together with the Fraunhofer Institute in, uh, in Ilmenau, the IEDMT, the Institute for Media uh, Technology. We are part of that. I'll get to the nerdy bit when, um, when I tell you what, what Digger is all about and how we detect deepfake or hope to detect deepfakes with Digger. But first, let's see a definition and how it works. Hello. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about a new technology that's affecting famous people. Remember when Obama called Trump a dipshit? Complete dipshit. Or the time Kim Kardashian rapped? Because I'm always half naked. Or when Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonated himself? Get out of this, the bombing bear. Get out! <laughs> deep fake, deep fake, deep fake. Gotta be kidding. This is a deep fake, too. I'm not Adele but I am an expert in online manipulation. Okay, this is uh, Claire Wardle <clears throat> from First Draft, a very big worldwide organization fighting misinformation. Uh, and they, yeah, just to show what you can do uh, with that technology, they produce a deep fake uh, themselves. And even if I roll this back, I mean, usually if you, if I show you more examples, but if you look twice, third time, you would see, oh, there's something wrong. Uh, it used to be like three years ago, you could always see people were not blinking into the camera. So that was a clear indicator this is a deep fake. Not anymore. Uh, if you look at that five times, ten times, you will have a hard time uh, detecting it's not Adele, but it's Claire Wall. So this is the state. This is where we're in. How does it work? Um, it looks also simple. You have an um, a, 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 a input source, so any kind of face. Then you have a target source. And then this is where the magic happens. In between, there is actually artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence tries to map the expression on these two faces onto, uh, the, target, um, onto the target face. You see that here with George W. Bush, funny enough, American presidents, are quite huge when it comes to researching deepfakes, maybe because there is so much public domain with video images uh, of them. But here you see uh, how it works. You see all this, what's, what's <clears throat> the guy in the, uh, in the upper photo does with his, his face is kind of projected in a way onto, um, onto George W. Bush. So as said, what, what's the magic part? Uh, let's look at this, and this is uh, yeah, the nerdy bit, sorry for that. Uh, and that is, to quote my, my colleague uh, Ruben, who has found this, um, this is how the machine learning bit, which is actually called, you see that, GAN, Generative Adversarial Network, uh, works. It's, there's one computer that knows the truth. There's one computer that has the real images of, let's say, George W. Bush. And the other one tries to come up with something as close as possible to what the guy does, what the face looks like, and the machine that knows the truth is just sending back singles, no, 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 until there is a similarity, and then it's okay. And then the next facial expression. So this is how machines learned these stage 
They're working together. It's collaborative machine learning. So just for your background, and this is how that actually looks in, uh, um, in, uh, when you do these, these kinds of experiments. You see, uh, you try to map the, the facial expressions, and the deep, deep fake tries to reconstruct this, and the technology that I just showed is in the background. The example, uh, so Auto the industry. results are like this. To help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing, clean energy, and the infrastructure that creates good new jobs. Not to mention the job training that helps folks earn new skills to fill those jobs. So the results are... Basically, that's Obama, different ages, all talking about the same, or talking exactly the same. And this is the most prominent uh, example because it's or, so nice. How about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now. You see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Okay, so, yes, we have identified this. We have examples, but we are only scratching the tip of the iceberg. Um, of these images here, none is a real person. It's all... GAN generated images and below that celebrity surface where these prominent stuff comes up I mean there was a uh, on the beginning of last week there was um, there was a um, another one with Arnold Schwarzenegger who seems very popular but these are very easily detected and they they kind of are more entertaining and stuff this is where the harm hits this is where people are whatever shamed um, because images are being distorted, because short Facebook messages pop up that they never recorded. This is where also we as journalists need to look at in order not to see society blow apart and get hate and, and let hate speech and stuff win. Here is where the deep fake um, action needs to be placed. And what we do, as said in this, in this project, we've joined the red race because like in doping or any any other thing where there's a red race between uh, the people trying to develop technology that gets better and better in these deep fakes we are trying to uh, help develop technology to um, to detect deep fakes so we come up with tools we can now look uh, into pictures another uh, fake here another deep fake that bird is not kidnapping uh, uh, um, a baby um, but you can look closely at a video, we have these tools. Uh, you can annotate the videos, you can do a, a reverse image search. So we have tools now to detect these, and what we do in, in Digger, and I'll leave it with that, is we look at the audio. The audio reveals quite a lot. The audio is like a fingerprint, yeah? So remember the Zuckerberg thing. You would have seen that the video does not match the, um, the, uh, the, the actual video, so this is, easy to, de uh, to detect, and this is low-key when it comes to computing power. That's why we look at the audio. Fraunhofer has a very interesting technology, and we're trying th to help them uh, to get that into application. Okay, this is the final minute. Um, now what? Not so easy, easily set, but not done. We need quality journalism. We need cooperation of all actors that are willing to spread uh, media and information literacy, good journalism, and we need training. Journalists need verification training. Um, in our journalist training, a verification training is mandatory for one week to, um, yeah, to know the tools that help you detecting false information. And we need to gear up. We have this nice tool. This is the advertising bit. Truly Media, we developed this with a partner. You can search, you can organize, and you can verify. It's a structured process. It's a collaborative process. You can involve your 
um, your colleagues in the verification. This is what helps. If someone is interested, I'll be here to also talk truly media, and I'll leave you with this. I said it's the Pope. That's also, I'm already carrying this around for four years because it's my kind of favorite deep fake. Have a look, the Pope, what he can do. Yes, are we impressed? We are impressed, and he is quite proud. So, um, yeah, that was it. Uh, I'm with DW Innovation. Um, I'm with Deutsche Welle. This is um, a kind of a metaphor for innovation because there is new technology, but it's not welcomed by everybody. So this last true story, this is the um, Shanghai, um, I think, or, or Tokyo uh, train station, this little guy was put up to help people navigate their way around in only two days uh, in the making. They had to put up this poster and say, please do not hit me, which I hope you won't do with me. And this is why I say thank you, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.